And we want to thank everybody again for joining us this evening. We're going to try to start on time and end on time as we have the last uh, each meeting since we started. Um, Leslie has been, as you can imagine, quite busy, um, not just preparing for this meeting, but she's got lots on her plate um, in a number of areas, as you can imagine. Um, and so I'm going to turn it over to Leslie. Looks like you've got our groups ready to go. I Dr. do. Bergstrom. And uh, so I will keep quiet. Thank you. I am set to go here. Let me just pull up a um, a very short slide deck that's just going to serve to um, orient us tonight. And of course, we all know that it is December 21st, so I can move right past this one. And we know the um, really amazing professionals who've agreed to uh, work with us on this incredibly um, important job of helping our kids get back to school safely and stay there safely. And so the medical group goals are something that have been um, reviewed on all occasions. And um, I just wanna move through that a little bit. I think everybody knows why we are together and we are trying to focus our conversations on things that are, are timely and are connected to these goals. And of course, as a school district, we're consistently driven in our actions by our values and that those values are the center of how we have created a uh, response plan to um, the pandemic and every decision that's had to be made related to keeping our students and our staff and our community safe. So you can see the purpose of this group to provide an opportunity for all participants to share their professional suggestions and input on how to get the OSD students back into school safely and keeping them in school. So the last time we were together was December 7th and um, I'll review that agenda a little bit tonight just to refresh everyone's memory since it's been two weeks, share updates that have occurred since December 7th, um, Drew Howick will review our working agreements. We will go into small group discussions similar to our last session on the four questions that I sent out earlier. We will um, share discussion themes then um, later on in our meeting and finally share a plan for our January 4th time together. So what did we do on December 7th? Well, we introduced our facilitator, Mr. Howick. We reviewed the norms of collaboration. We broke into two groups to discuss the question that was listed there. And we stayed in those groups for the majority of the meeting. And then we reconvened at 6.55. And that's when board members, Krista Flanagan and Tim LeBrun shared themes from the two groups. So what has happened since the last time we met? And I'm sure, um, you all know quite a bit has happened since the last time we met. Two of those things happened Monday and Tuesday of last week. Last Monday is when Public Health of Madison, Dane County um, shared their updated school requirements and recommendations. And I sent those out to you um, last week and I'm sure um, you probably read them far before that. I just wanted to make sure you had them if you needed them. Um, but as you know, based on that, there are no longer um, numerical uh, measurements related to positive case counts connected to when students should return to school. Instead, there are lists of requirements and recommendations. And then finally, on emergency order 11, that had to do with um, indoor gatherings and was highly connected to um, what we can do related to our athletic programs. So I will just give you a little bit of detail and then we'll move on to the next phase of our meeting. For instance, um, the last time the board met, um, gosh, I'm trying to remember. I think that was, um, we, oh gosh, we've had so many meetings, it's hard for me to remember. I think it was 14th. last week. 14th. <laughs> 14th. <laughs> Thank you. Last Monday. <laughs> oh my goodness. Uh, so this is what we presented the last time the board met, um, the 14th. And also what we spoke about with our parents of students in grades um, three through six. And that is, it was our um, plan prior to anything that public health sent out because they had given enough information to be able to reasonably assume 
that their updated recommendations would include a phase in for grades three through five. Consequently, we had sent information to parents saying this is our plan, unless something changes from public health or the updated recommendations don't align with it. And um, we were able to uh, start the ball rolling with our parents, picking their second semester selection of Oregon Online or phased restart, knowing that tentatively January 19th is the date that we were setting for those students to come back. And then um, making that a firm plan um, is very connected to um, suggestions, advice, thoughts that the medical working group shares this evening, in addition to establishing the return dates for grades 7 through 12. So you'll remember when the questions that I sent out had to do with your um, professional expertise related to the um, safety of spacing out the phases that we um, have for return to school. And of course, you'll also see that Oregon Online is um, will be offered for all of second semester for families who feel more comfortable going in that direction. So emergency order number 11, um, that had to do, as I mentioned earlier, with indoor gathering amounts. Emergency order 10 um, made it so that we were not able to practice with um, practice athletics with small groups of 10 students physically distanced. Um, however, emergency order 11 brought us back to where we were with nine, which means we could begin 10 person physically distanced practice practices. However, um, games, and games and competitions between uh, medium and high risk sports are um, not allowed in Dane County because remember this is an order, not a recommendation or not guidelines. Um, so there are a lot of boards making a lot of decisions related to this. And um, that's why I thought it was a really important question for this group to offer any insights um, that, they, that may they may have. In addition, the um, updated school recommendations and guidelines had an FAQ related, and one of the questions was related to athletics. And it was basically from the public, public health point of view, why can schools be open, but sports requirements are the same? Meaning you can't have um, medium and high risk competitions. And their response was, sports are a higher risk activity than a classroom learning setting. With sports, there is likely heavier breathing and less distancing, which increases the risk of COVID transmission. So in case any of you had missed that in their FAQ, I just wanted you to know that that piece of information um, was out there from public health. And um, we are able to start our winter practices on January 4th. Um, however, at this time, you cannot compete in Dane County. So now I think that I have you up to date on everything that we have been um, doing up until this point, all the different things that have changed since we met just two weeks ago. So I think that means it's time to uh, pass the baton to Mr. Howick, who will begin facilitating from here. Great, <clears throat> thanks Leslie, and be prepared. I'm gonna pass it back to you very shortly. <laughs> um, so um, as you received the information on Friday, you will notice that there are four questions that we're gonna ask you to um, comment on. Um, and um, th these are, as a result of a lot of the things that's happened between the last meeting and this meeting. So um, when we talk about our subsequent meeting on January 4th, we will, the plan is right now, we will circle back to some of the great suggestions that were made at the last meeting, particularly around addressing the mental health issues and needs of students and staff. Um, so we just want to let you know that those have not been lost at all. Some have actually been acted on, but the timing is such that the questions that Leslie submitted are, are important and prudent for us to deal with uh, today. So um, Leslie would like to say a couple things about these four questions, um, and then uh, I will um, talk about the process that we will use in our breakout groups uh, as well. And uh, of course, and I do want to commend, by the way, everybody and the feedback we received for doing a great job of following the um, seven norms of collaborative work. Um, this was last meeting, the first time you had a chance to actually dialogue and interact on a lot of the things and um, did an excellent job on, on these 
and we want to make, just keep them front and center as we go through. So Leslie, back to you, a little background on the four questions. Thank you. So um, as, as was stated, there were four questions that were sent out to you late last week, uh, and they are very connected to establishing a safe timeline for reentry. So we would really like to hear your, um, your thoughts, your professional expertise related to a few things, and I'll just refresh your memory for a moment and um, restate the questions. And the first is, given your area of expertise, what are the benefits and detriments of phasing in grades three through six? Note, I connected grade six to our three through five group on January 19th. That's 15 days post return from winter break. Do you think it's prudent to begin the next phase on this date? Why or why not? Hey, Leslie, we're still mm -hmm. seeing the norms. Did you have those mm -hmm. on the slide? No, actually, okay. I believe that I uh, okay. accidentally deleted that slide. That's why I moved forward a little bit. Like, where sorry. is it from? Okay, sorry. Um, the next one is public health has recommendations for when it's appropriate to close a school or an individual classroom. And I linked those in your email. What other factors might dictate a temporary move to virtual instruction after we have moved back to in-person? The next one, Public Health of Madison-Dane County recommends phasing in grade bands of students for in-person instruction. With concern for the health and safety of our students, staff, and community, what should be the minimum amount of time between phasing in different grade bands? And then the final question, and our facilitators will have these so they will continue to repeat it so that people know exactly what they are responding to. But under emergency order number 11, public health does not allow competitions for medium and high risk sports. It does, however, allow for practices in static groups of 10 with masks and six feet of physical distance and other safety precautions. The OSD winter athletic practices start on January 4th. Other than the public health order, what considerations or research should the OSD take into account when making decisions about when it is safe to schedule athletic competitions. And then please feel free to send me those if um, you come across it at a later date, because we are always happy for the, any information that people are able to give us. So we will um, be able to move into um, our groups a little bit. Drew will explain what it is we're doing. Yeah, great. Thanks, Leslie. So you can see the timeliness of these questions and why it made the agenda for this this uh, particular meeting. Uh, let me just quickly overview our breakouts because that's where we want to spend most of your time. Um, and there's some very uh, similar things that happened last time. Each group, as last time, will have a facilitator, uh, recorder, timekeeper, and reporter. Um, and uh, many of these people will have served the same function as last time. I'll facilitate one group, John Tanner, another. Um, our our uh, recorders are, are the same as last time. Timekeepers will volunteer and reporters are going to be uh, our two board members, Tim um, and Krista. Um, we want to structure it so that um, um, everyone has a chance to respond to each of the questions. Um, and as a result, you can imagine that the time frame is going to move pretty quickly as such. And again, like last time, we want to make sure that everyone uh, keeps their uh, their hat on in terms of your area of expertise, both health and safety related. Uh, I thought the group did a superb job last time of keeping our expertise hats on, and we would like to encourage you to continue that as well. What is different from last time um, is that there are four questions and not one. So things are going to move fairly quickly. Everyone will be invited to share at least one a response to each question, starting with question number one. Uh, and your facilitator will randomly call on people to keep it moving and so on. Um, if a response has already been stated to the question that you were going to give, just indicate that. Say, uh, I, what I was going to say, uh, Matt already covered. Um, if you do not have a particular response to that question, just say pass. Um, and for those who have something, then they will have time for doing that. 
Okay, so similar to this, um, we will go until uh, 4.55. So that's roughly 10 minutes of question. So uh, again, things are gonna move quickly, but at 4.55 or 6.55, excuse me, um, Krista and Tim will give a summary of what the highlights are of their group. Like last time, written documents will be uh, put a poll together so you'll have comments from what each group talked about. Uh, Leslie, did I any, miss anything before we go to breakouts? Tim? I don't think so. Thank you. Yes, just one quick thing. We have uh, some who have been on um, from the public uh, in the last couple of meetings, and we have some new people as well. And so I just want to make sure we're all on the same page with regards to um, the public in this forum. And so, Drew, can you address that or Dr. Bergstrom? Yeah, happy to. The, the uh, people who will be asked to, to weigh in on these comments uh, are the ones who will be able to uh, participate actively. Uh, those who are not in the committee, your participation is through observation. Um, and so uh, if you have any observations that you'd like to share uh, with this, Leslie, I'm sure we'd be more than happy to hear those comments. Um, we're glad you're here. It shows your interest. Uh, and um, your observation and any comments that you have after this meeting are welcome. Thanks, Tim. All right. Then um, I have been um, on the side working to drag everybody's icon into a working group. So I think we're just about ready to go in that direction. You bet. All set? Okay. Okay. Here we go.
Streak is alive, John. First one's back. John is very competitive about this. <laughs> I think you should get the credit as the timekeeper, really. I'm not competitive at all. Mm, yeah. <laughs> right, Troy? Not at all, Krista. I have never seen you, never seen a competitive side of you. I'm self-aware. I'm very competitive. You guys have all really given us amazing input over the course of the medical working group. I hope you all feel that you're very helpful to us because you, you are. I hope um, you feel like this has been worthwhile so far. Yeah, I would echo that as a board member. I've been sitting here taking notes of every comment um, so that I can accurately process that and, and use that uh, as we move forward. So very much appreciated. I really enjoy watching these meetings. And as a facilitator, you're just awesome because we make it back, you know, right on time every time. So that means that you're you're doing a great job and being very succinct with your comments, which I appreciate. Since we have a, a minute or so, there's something that I just want to throw out there that in my experience through all of this, so we have all these beautiful cleaning protocols. My toys and my furniture are degrading very, very quickly. So that's something just to kind of file in the back of our minds that we might have to be purchasing more stuff as we clean things so frequently and so often. Good point, Aaron. Zane is here to hear that and can make a note. Was that is his department. So mental note, stop using the hydrochloric acid on everything to, uh, you know, get it really super clean. So Zane, at the last meeting, Andy, uh, you know, educated us all about nerve filters and, um, you know, bipolar needlepoint ionization. You got any cool terms to throw at us this time? No, I guess the, the greatest news I've got so far is that our, our new filters actually have officially shipped and are in transit. So the, the magical MERV 13 filters that, you know, the unicorn that everyone's been going after ours are finally on there their way. So I think it's just going to be another, another kind of layer um, just to help protect the kids and everything. So those should be here um, right around Christmas time. So before everyone's back from winter break, those should be in the buildings we're using. And then we'll hit the older, the older buildings as we, as we go. So. Awesome. That's good news. So I know they've been on order since what, like May? Uh, I think so. Okay. So, excellent. It'll be like, you know, you know, can you wrap them in a bow and, you know, it's like your little Christmas gift? And I don't have time to, to fancy it up. We got to get them, got to get them in and get them rolling. So it's like that commercial, like, oh, why did I just unwrap this? You know, don't want to wrap it back up again. How big are they? I don't I mean because I've seen some of the you know the circulation units are some of them are gigantic. Are these at the circulation units or are they in the um, like filtering system? Like where do they sit? So they're smaller filters that kind of get put together like a puzzle to make a, a bigger one. So I mean they are in the rooftop units or in the air handler units, but they've got racks where you actually put you know six to eight or nine, ten filters together to to kind of form one gigantic filter. So I see the other group coming back. Welcome back, everybody. Um, that was uh, definitely time well spent. And I think, Drew, you're going to take us into the uh, final inning here, right? 
Uh oh, your mic's not on, Drew. Thank you. Um, Krista and Tim are prepared to give us a uh, up to five minute summary of their groups. If time permits, uh, group members can comment on the comments, if you will. Uh, that then leaves us about five minutes for Leslie to talk about um, our next gathering and what you can expect uh, prior to that. So Krista, Tim, rock, paper, scissors, how you want to do this? Krista's off of mute, so I think we'll start with her. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Thank you, Drew. Uh, the first question in terms of the benefits, detriments of the 3-6 phase-in on January 19th, here were our four themes. The first is that the incubation period is important, so it gives us 14 days post-holidays to kind of see what happens. So our group, um, that was one theme. Next is to still pay attention to community metrics and have a situational awareness of what is going on in the community that would impact our bringing kids back to school and staying in school. The third was... Uh, pay attention to siblings. As we add more grades in, we still have siblings that may be at home and what impact that is. And then the fourth is um, kids transitioning back in. When you look at fifth grade and you look at ninth grade, those students are also transitioning for the first time to a brand new school. So they've been off school for a long time, plus they're coming into a new school. And so how do we help them transition both in school and to a new school? So those were the four for that. Okay, great. So now we'll go to Tim. Um, any dittos there, Tim, or new information regarding that first question? Oh, Tim will need to do a mute. I, of course, never made that mistake, but go ahead, Tim. Yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, we had lots of similar uh, feedback. We felt that the 14-day period after the holiday was sufficient. There wasn't any detriment about going more or less. Um, they, they felt there was a reasonable amount of data. Here too, um, we, we had two mental health experts in our group and, and all um, you know, perspectives uh, from the two um, really wanted to hit home the fact that um, socialization and, uh, and getting back um, has all kinds of positive reasons to do that, but not at the risk of um, you know, diving into um, pulling kids back out. We heard often that uh, going in and coming out and going in and coming out um, is very hard on kids. Getting back to school is going to be uh, challenging enough. Um, we wanna make sure that once we're in, we're in. Um, we talked about um, the fact that, you know, the younger grades, again, limited exposure or limited uh, chance for spreading in those younger grades, a little bit more concern for seven through 12. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the 7 through 12 again in our next question. Um, uh, another detriment that came up was um, that um, families that are already struggling right now, um, uh, they're concerned about being ready for two hours of school um, a day or a couple of days a week. Um, they're concerned about the child care issues. Um, and uh, there was a mention also in this uh, question about uh, a couple of strains outside of the US, in the UK and in South Africa that we just need to continue to be aware of. That's okay. it, those are the ads. Good, thank you, Tim. So Tim, why don't we reverse this? Why don't you take the lead on the second question and Krista can backfill as well. Sure, very good. Again, the second question was, was about um, uh, Public Health Dane County and their recommendations around um, closing school um, if we run into an issue. One thing that um, was a very important issue that came up, um, we have a data person in our group and uh, mentioned that although uh, Oregon has, a, has had a spike in the past 10 days, um, there was a huge spike at Oak Hill um, out at the prison and that is spiking our numbers. So we just want to make sure that we have context around the numbers uh, and that we're focused on the school in terms of the school district specifically um, and that we don't get weighed one way or another um, uh, with regards to folks who are not in school. Um, uh, someone else mentioned here that tracking hospitalization rates and um, that a severe community outbreak outside of our area could create an issue in the hospitals we want to keep our finger on the pulse um, in that area. Uh, keeping an eye on emerging publications. Um, 
there's a fair amount of uh, data that's out there that said that says kids are more transmittable or not more transmittable. A lot of that data is older data, so we're trying. We need to keep an eye on uh, emerging data, especially as it relates to school-aged kids. Um, and let's see. I think I'll leave it at that for now. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Krista, anything else to add? Yeah, or we had three. Uh, one was follow the guidelines that Public Health made Madison Dane County has set in terms of uh, pulling back. Yeah. Two <clears throat> is um, a lot of this is really going to also be a factor and so, uh, associated with staffing and teacher impact. So ability to have uh, enough adults in the classroom. So it may not just be dependent on student numbers that we really have to take into account our adult numbers in our classrooms. And then the third was um, having a plan that we may be in the very unfortunate situation of having a staff member or a student die. And so having a plan and would that impact in terms of a bereavement period or how we would um, handle that as a school district. Mm. Okay, thank you, Krista. Um, can we stick with you uh, to start our summary for the third question, please? Sure. So this one is about grade bands and minimum. Is there a recommendation for a minimum time between grade bands? Our first a uh, theme has to do with, do we need to stick to a three, five, six, seven, twelve, or is it better for us to look at percentage of population by building? So a twenty percent, and then you add another twenty percent or a twenty-five percent. So instead of looking at a whole group by a school, do we look at percentage, which helps us kind of manage the numbers? Um, second is kind of related to that. Do we need to follow the the youngest to oldest or can we look at order based on uh, what we feel is best and there was a, a point that was made that there are right now they're seeing um, in terms of a mental health perspective a lot of our high schoolers are suffering and so do we need to wait you know have 9 12 go last or are there some benefits to really looking at a different grade order and then the last one was to make sure that we keep our um, eye on our health and safety practices that fatigue can come in, but make sure we're doing masking, social distancing, height, you know, cleaning and hand sanitizing. So to make sure that those things are really continued. Okay, thank you, Krista. <clears throat> Tim, what do you have to add to that? Well, this should be easy. We had very similar um, uh, themes, um, the population theme. In other words, we've got kids in all different schools. They use, you know, they use separate transportation. If we're looking at elementary schools versus high school uh, students, we are looking at separate transportation, separate buildings. Do we really need to separate it by grade, or it should should it be more by population per building? So, right, exactly what we heard for our first theme. Secondly, that mental health theme, and um, the mental health theme around those high school students uh, was loud and clear. Um, but what it really came down to, and I think it was very well described, is high school students know what they're missing. They are very aware of what they're missing. And it is harder, frankly, on their mental health than it may be for um, younger elementary kids. And lastly, I, again, that fatiguing, that uh, making sure that we uh, stick to the practices that we know work. The, the masking, the washing hands, the social distancing, et cetera. So we had very similar themes. We could have been in the same room for that group. Okay. For that question. Great. Thank you, Tim. So let's stick with you on this, Tim, and uh, provide a summary of the fourth question, which had to do with the uh, competition and, and sports. So we had uh, um, we had split themes there. We we without question we had um, one theme saying activity is super important. Um, we're seeing an increase in obesity. We heard that from a number of our professionals. A decrease in activity uh, again from a number of our profession professionals. And getting those kids active at any age uh, is um, a priority without question. Um, we talked a little bit about the fact that um, kids are going outside of the district and um, w would it be better for us to have a more controlled environment within the district um, for uh, kids to experience that activity and competition. Uh, and so there, there was a question um, at the end of that, um, at the end of that sentence. 
Um, should we be focusing more within Dane County? And at the same time, if we are doing well and we are looking to compete, is it a level playing field? Is who are the teams, if we do go back with some level of competition or um, some level of activity, um, is our competition um, playing by the same rules? Are they getting the same level of success? Or are we taking all the great things that we're doing ideally and being affected by uh, another team or another geography that isn't? And so um, uh, those, those were the themes that I, again, we had a group on the other side simply saying, you know what, we need to focus on school first. We need to do the school thing well and as a priority, and as long as that's going well, um, we should be able to get uh, uh, athletic competition going as well. Great, thank you, Tim. Krista? Um, <clears throat> there was broad consensus in our group to follow the recommendations of Public Health Madison-Dane County in relates to allowing of practices and not allowing competition outside Dane County was the first. Uh, second was as we do practices that we still uh, maintain uh, and have a broad uh, focus on masking, sanitizing, social distancing, not using of locker rooms so that we're maintaining those health and safety standards. Um, the third was really thinking about and having a plan in place now for when we do return to competitions about our spectators allowed, our parents allowed, what are we doing with locker rooms, um, what are the health and safety protocols associated with that. And then similar to Tim, uh, when we do return to competition, that we will be going to schools that potentially may not follow our health and safety protocols. And we have to have that into consideration in terms of where we go play and keeping our students and staff safe. Great, thank you, Krista. So um, it's 7-12, uh, Leslie, so I've cut into your departure comments and so on, but I do wanna thank uh, Tim and Krista for the reporting and our facilitators and the recording. Thank you so much for that. Um, again, this information um, will be captured, consolidated, and made available. So if we uh, didn't emphasize a lot of the things that emerged in your discussion, we will have documentation for that as well. So thank you. Uh, Leslie, back to you for closing comments. Uh, thank you. Um, I really appreciate all of the input that was um, offered tonight. We know how important it is for our families that we establish a, we establish a, a timeline for um, the phase in of in-person instruction. So everything that people contributed this evening will be um, a part of the thinking and discussion process related to making that happen. Now to close out, I want everyone to know what our next steps are because believe it or not, um, January 4th is the next meeting and it seems like it's uh, right around uh, the corner. And what we want to do is spend some time specific to ensuring we are um, meeting the mental health and social emotional learning needs of our students as they re-enter in-person instruction. So we want to be able to, um, we are preparing a short video for you to make sure all the members of the working group know what mental health supports are currently in place. And then we would like input from the group as to what we need to consider um, as far as additional supports as we phase in more students to in-person instruction. So we'll send you um, a video prior to the January 4th meeting so that you can watch it. It'll be short, we promise. So you can spend a few minutes watching it and knowing what we've already done so that um, you will have that foundation for um, the discussion that lays ahead. And once again, I thank you all and really appreciate the time you're spending and the input you're giving. All right, see you in uh, two weeks, everyone. Have a great holiday. Thanks all. Thank you.